thank all the organisers for inviting me here today. It's always good to speak to, to a nice crew like this. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yeah? Bring the microphone closer. A <laughs> louder? So I've got the shift that's just after lunch, so you're all going to be falling asleep in about five minutes. So just, just bear with me as much as you can. Um, so, just kind of where, where, where I come from or who I'm with, uh, Livestock Gentech, it's a, it's a, it's a centre at the University of Alberta that was set up under Alberta Inmates Bio Solutions. And I suppose the aim is to, to capitalise on I think the, the genomics that's going on, or the research that's going on in genomics, and um, get the, this research out onto the producer level and educate um, the producers and everybody here in front of me on what's capable with genomics. Um, so, as I said, it's, it's created out of the Agricultural, Food and Nutritional Science Faculty at the University of Alberta. So, I'm going to talk a bit about genomics. I'm going to, I'll mention feed efficiency and RFI um, in a few places throughout the presentation, but I'm going to level out of that to um, John Bazarb and maybe Alison, and I think William's going to talk a little bit more about it later as well. So, what I'm going to talk more about is um, uh, the technology that is genomics. So, I suppose just to get it started, just a few definitions. So, we'll go back to what's genetics. Genetics is what we study in, it's the, the study of inheritance. So, then when it comes to animal breeding, we use our knowledge of this inheritance or our knowledge of genetics in um, improving the genetic merit of our animal from generation to generation and use it in making breeding decisions. So where, where does genomics come into this? Well, genomics is a tool, I guess you, for lack of a better description, a tool that will help us in our understanding of inheritance and subsequently genomics is a tool that helps us with animal breeding. And by definition, genomics is the branch of molecular biology that's concerned with the structure, function, evolution and mapping of genomes. And a genome is the entire complement of genes within an organism. So, we all have a DNA code, similar to animals. It's about 300, um, about 3 billion base pairs long. And what I mean by a base pair is a pair of letters. So a whole genome is 3 billion pairs of these letters long. So when you look at an animal, just one animal, that's actually a lot of data to interrogate. And that's kind of where we do our genomics research, is the best way, the best mathematical algorithms to elucidate differences in, um, in genomes and see how they um, correspond to a, to a phenotype. So depending on that code, it'll dictate what you look like, whether you're good at sports, whether you're good at music, whether you're feed efficient, whether it, as William gave a great um, analogy earlier on, whether you only have to look at cake to put on weight or whether you have to eat a lot of cake to put on weight. Um, so th this code is made up of, of, of four base pairs, A, C, G and T. So for a very simple, um, well, tr I'll try to explain it simply. It's, it's how we, how we um, elucidate differences between animals. Say, just take two animals, and this is part of their genetic code, okay? Um, they have one slight difference there between them. Uh, I'm working two computers here, so bear with me. Um, so if we take two animals, um, and that's just two samples of a little part of their genetic code. Um, and we can see one difference there in the middle. They have a different T and a C. Okay, now you might have one animal that's okay for milk production or okay for marbling, and the other one is really good for marbling. So when we look at this on, say, over 2,000 animals, we can start to see what part of the genome attributes differences in different traits. So these little differences in, in, in a base pair is what we call a SNP, or a, a single nucleotide polymorphism. And this is what we use as markers for differences in traits. So, there's different, when we look at genomes, there's different densities that we can look at a genome. You, like, when, when, you're, when you're listening about genomics, you probably have heard terms 6K chips and 50K SNP chips and HD. And basically what they're referring to is different densities of, um, different densities of, of looking at a genome. 
we never look at the whole 3 billion letters at the same time. Basically because it's just too expensive to do that in the lab. So we kind of pick um, equally spaced markers or equally spaced SNPs along the genome. So just, just take this as a, as, a, as a schematic for say part of this genome, okay? And all these red little things here are markers or SNPs. So what we do is we collect D DNA on an animal and we see what their SNPs are like, what their genotype is like. And then we collect other measures, we call them phenotypes, like average daily gain, prime L intake, weight, or feed efficiency. And I just use RFI here. And then what we do is we do our association analysis, or our prediction equations. And we're able to see what markers are associated with what traits. And we do this in what we call, say, a discovery population. So this is our research population of, say, 2,000 animals. We can see what parts of our genome is associated with what trait, whether they're quick grow or growers or slow growers, whether they're high efficiency or low efficiency. And then we can use this information that we know on our research population to predict what's going to happen in the next generation of animals. So, this is what we're, we're using genomics for, is prediction of the next generation. And there's a quote from Niels Bohr, prediction is difficult, but especially about the future. <laughs> but I'd argue that Niels Bohr didn't know about genomics. <laughs> so how does genomics help us with predicting the future? This is just a, an equation, don't, don't get scared off, but it's, it's a simple equation. Um, and delta G, Delta G is what we, we term genetic gain, right? And the rate of genetic gain is influenced by, by four main things. Selection intensity, um, the accuracy at which we can make selection, generation interval, and the genetic uh, variance or the genetic standard deviation of trait within a population. And genomics really helps improve the rate or increase the rate of genetic gain by affecting two parts of this equation, the accuracy and the generation interval. And one kind of follows the other. So it improves the accuracy because we know more about an animal the minute it's born. The minute an animal is born, we can take a sample of DNA, right? So we don't have to wait. I, if you were out at the, at the, the ultrasound earlier on, um, you could listen to the fact that an animal has to be older before you can take an ultrasound back fat measure and then you relate that back to the sire and all of a sudden a, a sire has to be like three years old before we know what he's like for ultrasound back fat. With genomics we have we are able to get a better handle on what an animal will be like in the future right from the minute that it's born. So the minute it's born you can take a DNA sample, you can get it genotyped and if the equations are calibrated properly which is where we're what we're working on at a research level at the moment. Um, we should be able to tell you with good accuracy what an animal will be like in the future. So then you can make selection decisions whether you want to call the animal or sell it as a calf or keep it in your herd as a breeding animal. And following on from that increase in accuracy comes the inevitable decrease in select or generation interval. Now we don't have to wait for that bull to be five years old to see what his progeny can do before you say, ah, he was terrible and then you kill him. So you can, you can actually make a lot better decisions when the animal's a lot younger. And there's another slide or, or later on that, that I'll show you a bit more. So why is accuracy of selection important? Well, you can take it as a kind of a, a buyer beware when it comes to looking at accuracies next to EPDs. So you look at a sales catalogue and you look at the, the accuracies associated with all these EPDs. And low accuracy means that animal can actually re-rank substantially. So if you have a low accuracy from birth weight and uh, he, you think the animal is good for birth weight, like uh, CPD, all of a sudden that animal can re-rank and now you might be doing, doing very bad things to your, to your cowherd, giving it difficult cabins. So pre-genomics, accuracy was accrued through progeny recording. You had to look at the, the bull's progeny before you got any kind of decent accuracy on the EPD of a, of a bull. So really, just if a, if a bull just had a phenotype himself or had his, his, own, um, his own progeny or his own uh, parental average, we call it, the accuracy on that EPD is about 
you just get about um, 10 progeny on that animal and it can jump up very quickly. And we're talking a trade sale like weaning weight. You can get an accurate, you can get a fairly decent accuracy very quickly by just having 10 progeny on the ground. But bear in mind, having 10 progeny on the ground means that bull is now three, if not more years old. So you've had to feed this animal, you've had to grow it out to actually see what he's like and have to have one crop of calves on the ground that may or may not have worked out. And then you're getting up to, to 70 or more progeny um, to get accuracies of around 90%, to get nearly a perfect perfect um, handle on what he's like. So just possible EPD changes. I, I gave a few, ex or a few examples there, perfect weight, weaning weight and milk. Um, we'll just, for, for the sake of it, we'll just take one of them, we'll take birth weight. And possible changes in an EPD associated with a percent accuracy. So, if you an EPD of two for birth weight, you know, the, the, that animal's progeny will on average be two pounds heavier. Um, if, there's, if that's only 10% accurate, now all of a sudden that's, that bull's progeny might be two, two or more uh, less, and it goes up 30% accuracy, 50% accuracy. And the more accurate you get, obviously, the, the, the lesser the, that EPD can vary. And it's the same with weaning weight, the same with milk. And again, that's just another graph to show how the increase in progeny can increase the, um, the accuracy on the trade. So you're, you're getting up to the over 600 progeny before you kind of get, get a, a plateau on where accuracy can be improved. So that's just a few slides to show how important is accuracy. And I'll just kind of just reiterate the point. If ever you're looking at EPDs in a sale catalog, always look at the accuracy. Or even if they're not there, always inquire about the accuracy um, as to the accuracy associated with those EPDs. Because it is a caveat here. You don't want to, to put all your eggs in the basket of a bull that's not really proven. So pre-genomics, you know, um, accuracy is accrued through measuring more phenotypes and the, the, the quality of those phenotypes is also very important and, and the better recording of pedigree also adds to the accuracy of these, these genotypes. So getting back to where genomics can influence our, our, our accuracy is, as I said before, the minute the calf is on the ground, we can take a DNA sample. The minute we have that DNA sample, we can put that through our computers or breed societies can put that through their computers and, um, and get a, a, a genomically enhanced EPD out, which is, a, which is a more accurate EPD. And that's an EPD you have, again, the minute that calf is born. So this is just, again, another slide to show what, um, how, so once an animal is born, it has an increased accuracy when you use genomics. How many progeny is that equivalent to? Well, that's like that little calf that's just been born. That's as if you've seen already seen ten of his progeny. If we're talking about birth weight, if we're talking about weaning weight, that's as if that calf has already stepped three or four years into the future, and you've seen sixteen of his progeny. That's the lift in accuracy you're getting when you're using genomics. Now, all of a sudden, you're making very accurate breeding decisions when all your animals are very young, and increasing your rate of genetic gain. Um, this, this slide was actually for a different conference, but I, I thought I'd just show it anyway. It's, um, and you can concentrate on the beef or you can, you can take a look at the dairy side of things. Um, you say a cat, a cat, or take a bull, his first batch of calves are on the ground and that bull is already two years of age. So that's when his first batch of calves are raised. Next thing you have to start collecting data on all those animals. And if it's a trait like carcass weight, all of a sudden that bull is nearly five years of age by the time you have carcass data on him. And so on and so on. And you know, by the time a bull is seven years of age, that's when you have an accurate proof in him and he may have already done damage or you may have been able to pick a, a more suitable bull. So that's, that's how it influences accuracy. But it can also help with, um, there are traits that are difficult to measure. Um, and there's sex limited traits, there's expensive to measure traits, and there are terminal traits. Sex limited traits, obviously, you're not going to be able to measure 
um, milk production in a bull. So once we know what the bull's daughters can do, we can use genomics on the daughters, and that'll all feed back into the bull. You expensive to measure traits, I suppose, such as feed intake. At the moment, it's a, it's everybody's wondering is it is it worth the investment to invest in or measure feed intake? But if you do it, if you measure feed intake or feed efficiency on a bull and use genomics on all his progeny, then you can get a good proof or a good um, handle on what the progeny's modified would be without having to measure them all. And again, terminal traits. Some animals you have to sacrifice in order to be able to recover the phenotype. But if at a proof or maybe at a feedlot level, if you were able to tell the packer that all these animals will definitely be good for, for marbling or all these will definitely finish within a certain period. That's that's very valuable to both the packer and the and the feedlot guy, maybe. So that's how, how genomics can, can influence breeding and how, how it can help production. So you're probably asking, well, how can we use it? What what are the tools? How how can we how can we use genomics on, on our farms or in our production systems? And when you think tools, or sometimes you just think of something that you literally, a tool, like a hammer. Like literally, what, what can I hold in my hand? Uh, well, the first kind of tool that you nearly need, but you, as a producer, you wouldn't use it, is the lab that uses it, and that's a SNP chip. And that's literally what you put the DNA on, and you put it through a machine, and it gives you back all your A's, G's, and T's, and C's for your animal. Now, you're not gonna be able to do anything with that if you get a Word document that was full of A's, G's, T's, and C's. There's, there's no making sense of that. Even sometimes I can't make sense of it. So you have to put it through all these algorithms and, and associate it with your, your other um, databases to make sense of it. And this is where genomically enhanced EPDs come from. This is say where a breed society will have its, its, its um, usual EPDs, but once you put <coughs> genomics with it, you can term it genomically enhanced EPDs. And usually this is an EPD with, as I said before, and increased accuracy. Um, there's a molecular breeding value which is different to an EPD. It's um, a breeding value that's derived just solely from, from uh, a, a DNA test or a genotype, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. And then there's a, a macro assistant management type of use of um, genomics. So these are a few things that, that, a few ways or a few tools that you can use genomics. And I'll just talk about um, those in a little more detail. So as I said, there's different densities to what you can look at a genotype. Um, there's 6K, 50K, 770K, and now with all the research, there's a lot more densities. And just take, just take those as little snapshots of the genome. Um, say that's what 6K might look like. That's how many pieces of information you get back. For 50K, that's how many pieces of information you get back. And again, more dense, 770K, you get a little more information back. And the reason, they're all different densities available is because there's different price points. You know, you might use a 770K, which is about $150 to do your breeding bulls. He's going to have the most genetic inputs. But if you're maybe looking at your heifers, you might just take a little lesser price point and maybe look at a 6K genotype and get the results from that. So there's kind of strategic use of all these different densities. So higher densities, again, them on your influential animals, lower densities on your, on maybe what I call there the masses, but obviously you're not going to genotype like every animal. It'd be more like the, the animals you're, you're um, interested in. So really, as a producer, you don't do anything with the actual genotype. The genotype is, is through your service provider, whether it's a third party or whether it's your breed society. And how do you see those back on the other end? How, how do you see the genomic information. Well, you actually see it no different, really, than how you look at EPDs. Um, you know, it, it does exactly what it says in the team. It's, it's a genomically enhanced um, expected progeny difference. It's delivered in the same way, but with an increase in accuracy. So, just take this as a little, a little snapshot of a of a report you could get back in an animal. You've got all its uh, your your information there in EPDs and fertility calving. That's an, actually an Irish example, but I'm sure you can uh, you can relate to it. You've got your little bar graphs um, for your different traits. Um, so really, you're seeing 
nothing different and you're reading it nothing different but at the back end you're reading more accurate information so where can I find them these genomic you know, and CPDs usually they're flagged in a, in a sale catalogue or an, an AI catalogue and um, you, you may notice that they do have an increased accuracy compared to the guy that doesn't have maybe a DNA sign next to him or something how do you get them? If you were bulls, you genotype your bulls, and I'm sure contact us at the university or, or contact your breed society or um, a third party that you know is involved in genotyping, and they'll send you out kits and they'll coordinate the whole logistics of you genotyping your animals. Um, and again, it's not just for bulls. You know, you can do your heifers at a lower density at a lower cost. It also yields um, profit in the long run. So then there was another tool that I mentioned, an MBV, a molecular breeding value. And this is a breeding value that's kind of different from an EPD. Um, this is really where, this could be used, say, for a commercial guy that's not really tied into a breed society. He's just kind of, he has a pop, he has a herd of Angus Hereford Cross or Charlotte Hereford Cross or whatever he has. Um, doesn't really keep track of pedigree information, but he is able to take DNA on this. And if you go to maybe a third party or a university or somebody that's offering a service, that they'll have this big research population of say maybe 10,000 animals all across bread. When we look at the DNA of that animal, we can relate it to what's happening in our research population and tell you how good the crossbred animals are for birth weight, weaning weight, marveling, you know, and the different carcass traits. So we kind of use what we call our discovery population, you know, just different animals that we've collected data on and then we add that information to our, our, our DNA measurements, our weight measurements, our fertility and our carcass measurements and we're able to get out um, a report again probably will come in the same way as your genomically enhanced EPD report or we're able to get all this information um, and I'll keep saying this when the calf is born at a very young age so where can you find these MBVs? Again, they should be flagged in your AI catalogs or sale catalogs. And how do you get them? Well, they're provided by some genotyping companies. Um, there is an opportunity for um, for breed societies maybe to, to follow the progeny of some of their their elite bulls into the commercial sector. So you'd be able to get maybe able to get um, MBVs from your breed society or. Um, or if you're not part of breed society, get onto your breed society, get, like, pick the breed society that you work closely with. And, but you may have to make sure you don't have to read them. Make sure you're comparing apples with apples. So those two, <coughs> so those two initial ones were kind of using them for, <coughs> for, using them for breeding decisions, uh, picking animals based on uh, genetic merit. But there's also, we can use genomics for marker assisted management. William would say the way they used the leptin test, they were able to partition animals, whether they were CC, GG, or CG, can't remember the actual letters, they'll, they'll grow quicker, or they're medium growers, or they're, they're slow growers. So that was a good example of marker assisted management, the segregation of the animals based on how fast they grow. A very simple, um, very simple use of this, DNA technology or genomics is um, parentage. If you run multi sire pastures and you're getting a bunch of bad calves and you don't know what bull is responsible for whom, unless you've got a color marker on the bull. Um, so that's where parentage will come in. If you've got eight bulls running with your herd of cows, you need to know what bull to call, otherwise you're going to have to call all of them, or else you're going to have to take it maybe a hit again next year. So that's where parentage can add a lot of value to to um, your breeding decisions. Your control of inbreeding. If you don't know, again, if you don't know whether this bull may have relatives in your herd, one, you might take a chance and just not buy him. But if he's a very good bull, you want to limit your risks. So you can actually control inbreeding with your measurement of, of, a, of an animal's genotype. And then there's the whole single gene testing or testing for, for elite recesses. Um, I just put up a list of them there. You can, Look for differences like in horn, the pole, look for um, myostatin genes, curly calf, 
um, epileptic genes. Now, I was actually look. I just put up a list of those. There's, there's a lot more. And I was actually looking for a few pictures that I could put up down along the side. And they were the two of the most uh, stomachable pictures, I suppose you could get, because a lot of those uh, heat recessives turn out animals are absolutely disgusting to look at. So I got off Google Images fairly quickly when I was putting that together. I was about to turn that away. I didn't know what I was talking Okay, so again, there are some of the, there are some of the things you can do. Parentage, um, if we control a lot of those heat recessives. Um, sorting your animals based on, there, there's a piece of work came um, out of Guelph recently from Steve Miller's group, and they actually found two, two or three nice little snips or polymorphisms associated with, um, with tenderness. So if you were able to guarantee a packer or, or your local butcher or a, a private buyer that these animals are guaranteed tender or they, they're I can guarantee to a certain percentage that these animals will be tender or that they don't need as long hanging. Um, there's, there's a price point in that for vendors, there's a price point in that for packers. They don't need to have that carcass hanging as long. So if you can spend $10, $15 on a test, I can guarantee that. I guarantee you will make that $10, $15 back plus more if you can guarantee this type of supply. And that's just one use of a, a marker system management for genomics. You can base that on, you know, there might be marker system management for giving the animal the appropriate diet. Or, as, <coughs> as, uh, as William said earlier on, that, that, that leptin test, again, that's for growth rates. So these are all little man marker system management techniques that you can, that you can use uh, genomic for. Again, meat allocation. What's the best bull to use on your cow? You may have a choice of bulls. But which is the best bull for your cow? This can be done with genomics. It's, it's usually done by pedigree, but again, in the absence of pedigree, it can be used uh, done by genomics. Or it can be, the, the pedigree made allocation can be enhanced by genomics. So there's a, there's a few different things that I went through there. There's, there's your MVVs, or your GPDs, there your macro assistant management. And I guess you could all say, they're all for different parts of the whole production chain. This is a little slide from um, Alison Van Ian, uh, a researcher in, in UC Davis in the States. And this is kind of where there's, there's different uses of DNA technology there on the left hand side. You've got marker assisted selection, parentage, recessive testing, control of inbreeding, mate selection, management, traceability, product differentiation, and, and a few more. And, what part of the value chain uses genomics for a different thing will, will vary. So say you've got the seed stock guy, the commercial guy, the feedlot guy, the processor. So all of you out there, you're probably maybe looking at one, two, maybe three of those chains or those links of the chain that you're involved in. So just have a look there of who you are and where genomics can benefit you. If you're a commercial guy, you can use it for parentage, you can use it for DNA selection, can use it for the control of inbreeding. And there's a few more there. If you're a feedlot guy, you can definitely use it for marker assistant management or marker assistant purchasing. And this goes all the way to the, to the packer. It can be used for traceability and product differentiation right at the end. So it, it really has a lot of promise. Genomics and this DNA technology has a lot of promise for hitting every link of the beef production chain. But we'll just get rid of our need to collect weaning weights. We'll get rid of the need to collect birth weights. Unfortunately not. It nearly, um, it nearly increases the need, or at least it highlights the importance of, of phenotypes. I always put this quote in any presentation that I give, and it's in the age of the genotype, phenotype is king. One of our colleagues at the Scottish Agricultural College, Mike Coffey, always says that. And, and it's very true, and it's something I buy into. The more genotypes we collect, Genotypes are now the easy part, right? We can easily collect DNA, we can easily put it through the lab. The hard part now is actually getting out and collecting weaning weights, collecting birth weights, you know, collecting, I want to say milk, but you're hardly going to milk a beef cow, well, you can if you want, you wouldn't advise it. You know, uh, collecting all this carcass information, it's, it's more important now to have all these phenotypes fed back in. 
and that's just kind of schematic of, of how it all comes together. You have the phenotype, you have the observation on the animal, and you have the genotype, and then you put those together to see what happens in, in the next generation of animals. I was going to go through a bit about how the results are generated, but I think I don't think I need to go through that. I was asked actually by the by the lab to put in a little note about sampling and taking uh, DNA samples. Just a, a quick show of hands here. Who's taken? So I suppose where 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 do we get DNA from? A blood sample, tissue, semen, hair. There are four preferential ones. Nasal swabs we don't really like because actually when you swab, uh, when you take a nasal swab, there's a lot of bacteria in there, and bacteria also have DNA. So when you go to genotype a, a nasal swab, you're you're getting kind of a, a, a mixed pool of DNA. So this is when you're sampling. This is where DNA comes from: blood, tissue, semen, hair. So just a show of hands, who's collected any or all? Yeah, you've you've all done it at some stage. So. It can be messy, and especially when you're out in whatever temperatures you here, like minus four. I've only been here two years, so I'm only getting to you, getting used to the temperatures now. But you know, it, it can be difficult, and when with cattle running through a shoot, it can be difficult to, to get quality samples. But if you're doing it, just just slow down maybe a, a small bit, because in the lab we do see bad samples coming in, and it's it's always crushing when an, a farmer or a producer asks, "How is that bull turning out?" And we're like, "Oh." That bull actually, there was, there was no, there wasn't enough tissue in the punch, and he was like, God, oh, I was actually interested in that bull. You know, so, you know, just just make sure the samples are good and don't waste time or money because it'll still have to be processed through the lab. And um, there are sampling kits for all of this. You know, we, we get a lot of stuff in the lab where there's literally, you know, just a bunch of mucky hair stuck into an envelope and stuck in the post. And I don't actually do the lab work, but I get an email every so often from the girls in the lab. Like they've had to clear the lab because that's been stuck in a mail room, a hot mail room for about a week, and they open this vacuum pack bag and just this thing, <laughs> and, and the DNA is very good at it. <laughs> so that's just a, a little note about sampling and, and how how it all adds up. Um, What's the preferred? What's the preferred? Uh, Tail hairs or blood? I say blood. Blood, but for the for the dry on No, no, no. Um, it'll, it'll have to be. Actually, I suppose the easiest, um, the, the best trade-off between easy to sample and easy for DNA extraction is a hole punch, the ear punch. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And as I said, at the university, like through our through our, um, our lab there, we've we've all these sampling kits, and you know they're 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 readily available from from any genetic source. And so I suppose that's a good trade-off. Uh, blood is, is easy to get DNA from, but it's a little harder to sample blood. Um, semen, usually we get that if it's in an AI straw. Um, that's really good for if you're trying to track down a, a historically bull or something, that there'll be some, some semen straw in, in some tank in some corner of Alberta. That, and we, we've done that. We've, we've tracked down some of these old, old Hereford bulls and old Angus and Charlie bulls. And there'll be in some corner of, of, of a of Canada in, in some time summer. So yeah, they, they're, they're all, that's, that's a little bit of a good sample. Um, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just go through this very quickly and I'll, I'll kind of wrap up then after that. But when we're talking about 770K, kind of that's the, the densities we're looking at, but we're just, we have a project going at the moment. It's called the Genome Canada Project. And it's really, filling in the blanks of what we already know. So say that's a, a 770k genotype, there are the little pieces of information we pick up. Okay? We can go one better and actually hit every part of the genome sequence. Now, it's quite expensive to do, so what we're doing it is on is these really old influential bulls. And then we can fill in the blanks, so if we know the whole sequence of, a, of, a bull, of, a, of an influential bull, and then we get like, 770k and his, his son or his daughter, we're able to fill in the blanks of the son and the daughter. So all of a sudden, this is a, a project that's ongoing at the moment, we're able to get like whole genome sequences and a lot of animals. And this is really at a research level at the moment, so that, that's kind of why I left it till the end. 
is that this is where the Japanese Arabs are involved in, and a lot of universities around the world are involved in this. It's a big collaborative project because it's an expensive thing to do, is actually just see what the whole complement of genes um, are in the animal and what they all do specifically. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up there, and just to, as a concluding slide, um, Depending on who you are, there's different tools, and, and that slide there earlier on, where your seed stock uh, uh, process or feedlot guy or commercial, there's different things you can use genomics for. Um, and there are different tools available, genomically enhanced DPDs, molecular breeding values, or using the genomics for macro system management. Um, this has been really good in dairy, and it's shown a lot of problem, promise in dairy, but we, we run into one little problem in beef. It's not a problem, it's just a, it's a, it's the nature of the industry is that there's, there's a lot more breeds involved in beef production. Um, dairy had it easy, I guess you could say, in the fact that one, they, they see their animals twice a day for milk. They can collect phenotypes very, very easily. Um, they can sample DNA very, very easily. Also, they, they have a uniform worldwide breed. The worldwide dairy breed is nearly predominantly Holstein. You know, and there's, there's there's a, a, a readily, the genetics are readily exchanged between countries, um, whether it's true, a, a lot more so than beef, I would say. Um, so they, they, had a, they had a good start, and we're kind of, we're learning from where they went wrong, so we're not that far behind them now, especially with the inbreed genetic evaluations. So the big challenge at the moment at a research level for us is to get genomics working at a crossbred level for the commercial guys. Um, and that's, again, that's where we are with our sequence information is will this sequence information help us to elucidate the difference of a crossbred population? So this time next year, if I stand up here again, there will be a lot more information that I'll be able to, to tell you and a lot more services that maybe I'm not. Again, just a few acknowledgements of, of, of funders and who I'm here under and, and the invites today. So with that, Thanks for your attention and we'll, uh, we'll take any questions. John, um, at this point, um, how much accuracy can you predict in some of those crossbred populations? So it, it's 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 getting pretty good at the moment, and I'll just, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, rather than do our own research, there's a really good researcher in um, Australia named Mike Goddard, and he just has a paper there very recently with a new method, a new statistical method on, on how to do this prediction. And we'll take RFI, he's predicting RFI with about just short of 60% accuracy. Yeah. So, and that's without, you know, there's not much pedigree information there, that's nearly just an MEV correlated with the, with the actual phenotype observed. So, it, it's getting good very quickly. If you had a herd of 30 cows, a herd of, a herd of cows, who was 30 years old, who derived off of purebreds, what could you tell me about this cow? We could tell you, uh, are they still all purebreds? Yeah, they, they're not registered. They're not registered. Everything that's been used on them has been purebred within one breed. Yeah. So, so at the moment, I guess there's no EPDs in those animals. No. Yet they're all, they're, they're, they're all, all here for They're all so, derivatives of registered cattle. Yeah. They started that. So you could get EPDs in those animals just by genotyping them. Even though you haven't been tracking the pedigree, mm. you'd be able to, if you get a genotype on all those cows, you'd be able to measure the relationship. So what pedigree does? Is it measures the relationship between animals. Like a sire and a, a son have a relationship of 0.5. Mm -hmm. a son, like a father and a son will share half their genes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so pretend you didn't know that that calf was the son and then you, you measured their relationship by looking at their genotype, it should come out to about 0.5 as well. And all of a sudden you realize he's your son. What does that feel like on those cows? Depends on how many animals they turn out to be related to. Well, that's that's 